You know, I think to speak about Jesus as a preacher slash teacher in Matthew in particular, what I would say is that I think what characterizes his preaching is that it's authoritative. That's what's really emphasized that sure. Jesus is presented as this authoritative teacher. In fact, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you probably recall the response to the message is, wow, we have never heard teaching like this. He teaches with such authority, not like our scribes, <laughs> which is, a you know, the beginning of the conflict that is certainly going to happen between between the scribes and Pharisees and Jesus. They, they didn't like that comment, I'm sure, you know. Hey, welcome to the Expositors Collective Podcast, episode 230. I'm your host, Mike Neglia, and the voice that you just heard is that of our guest this week, Dr. Jonathan Pennington. Now, I got a chance to speak with him last year about the first and the last minutes of our sermons and the importance of crafting an engaging introduction as well as a satisfying conclusion at the end. And, and you know what? That episode was the most listened to episode of 2021. So I know that you guys like listening to Dr. Pennington. So he was very happy to come back on the show. And this time we speak about the Sermon on the Mount. We speak about the teaching and preaching ministry of Jesus himself. Now, Jesus is like the great subject and the hero of our sermons, but in what ways should Jesus be a role model in our own preaching style and sermon construction? So in just a few minutes, you're going to hear Dr. Pennington speak about in what ways Jesus is a role model, and then also what are some of the ways that we're supposed to be different preachers than Jesus. So I'm going to get out of your way, and you can hear from the expert himself. Here is Dr. Jonathan Pennington speaking about the preaching style of Jesus. Uh, Well, hi, welcome to the Expositors Collective Podcast. I'm thrilled to have a returning guest, Dr. Jonathan Pennington. Uh, Good morning. Welcome back on the show. Hey, it's great to be here. So before I, I got some questions, we'd love to talk about the Sermon on the Mount, human flourishing, and then even specifically the, the Beatitudes. But in researching and getting ready for this interview, I heard you mention that you used to be a big heavy metal fan. Is that is that true? <laughs> uh, not only a fan, but a, a producer, not a, that is a I mean, a producer of heavy metal. That is a player of heavy metal. That is. Yeah. Is that yeah. right? Is that yeah. right? I'd love I'd love to hear more. Yeah, it's just when I was in high school, that was the era of Metallica and Megadeth. So I was in high school in the mid 80s. So my life was was metal. Yeah. So that, I mean, I played in a band, played bass in a metal band that was horrible, of course, and uh, named Roadkill. Roadkill. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> good times. Good times. That's so great. God was preparing me for the later 10 years of my life where I was a worship pastor, not not of a metal sort, but of another sort, but God knew what he was doing and teaching me to be a musician through metal. So Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, uh, I recently spoke to uh, Dr. Justin Holcomb and found out that he also was in a heavy metal band. So now I'm just like, I'm looking for what is it about uh, theologians that that make have all of you go through like a metal stage first, and know. then you settle down. But uh, anyway, I'm we're sure. gonna go gonna go look up Roadkill and see uh, if I can find yeah, they any don't of those exist. recordings. Nothing. Thankfully, it was pre pre digital anything. So okay, well that's I'm, I'm sorry that I'm sorry for the world's loss. Yeah. I'm sure. um, so I, what I'd like to mostly talk about for for this conversation is, as I mentioned, the, the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus's most famous sermon. And um, I suppose I know, Dr. Pennington, that you've spent so much of your life looking at the, the Gospels as a genre and the Gospel of Matthew specifically. Um, I wonder, like, what have you noticed about the preaching of Jesus or to put it another way, like, what kind of preacher do you think Jesus was? Mm. Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, <clears throat> you really can't separate it from the other side of that coin of what kind of teacher was he. 
Um, I, that was just fresh on my mind as well. I'm currently trying to finish up an essay for a, a whole academic book that I'm only one chapter in on Jesus as a teacher in Matthew. So it's that, that oh, really? Oh, and yeah. It's, it should be coming out in the next year or so. And I think I'm probably holding the book up right now, honestly, but uh, I'll get to it. Um, but I, it, so I've been thinking about that and there'll be a lot of good essays in there on that question. And so teaching and preaching are different in my mind. In fact, referencing back to, to the book, small preaching we talked about last time, I actually make a distinction between teaching and preaching, but there's also, of course, a lot of overlap. It's, you know, the use of words to instruct and give vision <clears throat> and to invite people to disciple, to be disciples. Um, you know, I think to speak about Jesus as a preacher slash teacher in Matthew in particular, what I would say is that I think what characterizes his preaching is that it's authoritative. Um, that's what's really emphasized that sure. Jesus is presented as this authoritative teacher. In fact, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you probably recall the response to the message is, wow, we have never heard teaching like this. He teaches with such authority, not like our scribes, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is, a you know, the beginning of the conflict that is certainly going to happen between between the scribes and Pharisees yeah. and Jesus. They, they didn't like that comment, I'm sure, you know. Spe the scribes especially, have slain their thousands, but Jesus has slain tens of thousands. Mm, <laughs> I don't love that metaphor, but yeah, that's good. Um, so, but, and, you know, that also relates to Jesus's, um social status and his educational social slash educational status which was not as a rabbi i mean he ends up people call him rabbi and philosopher and stage and all these things but he clearly is not part of that educated class um, and on this i think one of the my friend chris keith his book jesus's literacy is really interesting and another book of chris's um jesus against the scribal elite both of them talk about this sort of major educational difference between Jesus and the, and the rabbinic class. And that added to the conflict between them because he taught with such authority and preached with such authority when he was clearly not educated in the same way they were. Okay. And, and yeah, and he, and he overturns them. Like he constantly says, have you not read, which is a very, you know, that's one of a very rhetorical, powerful statement. So on the one hand, he's authoritative. Um, and at the same time, especially in Matthew, but it's true in all the gospels, um, Jesus as a preacher slash teacher is mysterious in that he, the things he says are not always clear. And that becomes a very important theological point in the gospels that Jesus, Jesus is teaching and preaching separates all people into two categories. Those who are granted understanding from the father and those who are not. And that's a hard thing to say, hard thing to, to sort of even think about, you know, but that's a very clear emphasis in all four of the Gospels. For example, in Matthew, uh, Jesus says in 1125, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise, but revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, this is your goodwill. No one knows the Son except for the Father, and no one knows the Father except for the Son, and the one the Son chooses to reveal to him. So come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Same theme is in Mark, where Jesus is, nobody understands who Jesus is except for the demons. Uh, in Luke, Luke, Jesus is a teacher, and Luke is a little bit more clear. Um, for example, and I haven't said anything about this yet, but the clearest example of Jesus' mysterious teaching is his parable. So I should have said that sooner. That, that's so he's simultaneous authoritative, but his teaching in parables, if you read in the Gospels, Nobody ever understands what he means by his parables. So his disciples have to come to him and say, what, what did that mean? What did that you know, metaphor mean? What did that parable mean? So all that to say, he's simultaneously authoritative and, and mysterious. So you could cut all that other stuff. He just wanted me to get the, the sound bite. There it is. I finally got to it. But, uh, but that's, that's what I was trying to get to. Well, no, the best thing about <laughs> these podcasts is that we're not looking for sound bites. We're looking for those long answers, long form answers. Okay. So. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to shorten my answers a little bit. So. Uh, no need. No, please don't. Please don't. What? So now I, I'm I'm aware of like in the book of Acts describing Paul. I think there's a phrase that Luke uses a few different times, saying that like that Luke gestures with his hands, uh, or that he's kind of a he talks with his hands. Um, is there anything similar like like the form of Christ's teaching? So it's authoritative. It's mysterious. Um, anything you've noticed about how he teaches? 
That's a really interesting question. Uh, <clears throat> he sits. Yeah. Okay. Which is which is a sign of authority. Um, so Matthew five one and two, it says he five one. He went up on the mountain and sat down. So I always say when I'm teaching teaching the Sermon on the Mount, I always you know look out upon the crowd and you know make this joke of you know you're welcome. You know culture has changed. You lazy bums. I'm the one up here standing while you're all sitting. But yeah. but in the ancient world, it was the opposite. The teacher sat, and that was because it's this picture of a seated as a throne, even or as a you know some kind of position of authority um which continues of course to this day in many traditions yeah so that's that. that's one thing yeah that is that's the ultimate sort of one of it is things that are spoken from the chair in that sense um you know i don't think the gospels say much about um his style except for of course the words being both authoritative and mystery mysterious mm-hmm. as i said but i think one of the most important things to infer is that he was warm uh, and welcoming because, you know, the, the only people that don't like him are the ones who are threatened by his authority that is threatening their authority. But the regular people loved him and flocked to him. And that is the sign that he must have been, and he says it, he says it as much, come to me all who are and heavy laden. But it, he, his tone and demeanor and posture must have been warm and welcoming uh, or else regular people would not have, not have flocked to him and literally thousands upon thousands. So, um, yeah. yeah, I guess the only other thing we can infer from what he does say is that, you know, he was very creative and imaginative in the sense of, uh, you know, great analogies, like any good teacher, he mashes ideas up together and makes you see in a new way, you know, in the parables, of course, being great examples of that too. So, yeah. Well, then the, of course, the follow on question from there, you know, as we're a podcast about teaching and preaching or personal study and public proclamation of God's word, what, what do you think that contemporary teachers and preachers should be modeling from Christ? And then mm-hmm. is there anything that we, we shouldn't be? I mean, even thinking of those two things that you said, he's authoritative yet mysterious. Is there a, mm-hmm. mis- <laughs> like, should we aim for mystery when we're preaching or should we aim for, for clear? Oh, I, I don't want to ask any leading questions to you. No, um, no, no. That's a yeah. great question. Yeah. How, no, really. how could we, how could we learn? And then what should we not learn from the way that Jesus preaches in public? Yeah, I, I love that question. I've pondered that myself. And I think you probably feel and our listeners probably feel the same way. Like, are you saying there's something we shouldn't learn from Jesus? You know, yeah. that just seems like a weird kind of framing of it. But um, so, you know, it makes me a little hesitant. But I do think, yeah, the authoritative, as long as that's understood as not harsh and demeaning, because mm-hmm. Jesus is certainly not that in light of what I've just said about the warm and welcoming. Um but the mysterious part is really the, that's really the crux of the issue is it should we be that way? Because the way his parables work, and it, this is explicitly stated in Mark 4 and Matthew 13, is that they do separate people. They, they, they separate those who are granted understanding and those who are not. And so, you know, how, how does that become a model for us? Well, I would say that that's more descriptive than prescriptive to use some kind of language we often use um, when we talk about acts, for example, but I think that's probably more descriptive than prescriptive in terms of the model for our preaching. That is that when we preach, we go for clarity, um, but we recognize that the result is going to be um, a separation of people into those who understand and those who don't. Um, I think that's a fair kind of reading of that. In fact, the parable of the sower, which is the primary parable yeah. in the synoptic tradition, uh, it's the head of all the parable teachings. So in Mark 4, Matthew 13, um, it, I think that is primarily, it's both prescriptive and descriptive, but I think it's primarily descriptive. That is, it's saying when the gospel goes forth, expect this is going to be the response. Some people are not even going to care. Some people are going to care for a little while and quickly you know, and have no soil. Some people are going to care for a little while and get choked out by the cares of the world. And some people are going to bear fruit. And I think that is a description of what is going to happen when we preach. 
but I think the call to us is to preach with clarity. And I think that we could, we'd have to go to Paul and all the things he himself says about his ministry, that it was gentle. Uh, it was clear and it was at points pointed in terms of if there was a heresy at stake. Um, but there, you know, it was clear and it didn't shrink back. And especially you think of the Corinthian correspondence, he talks about his um, openness his uh, openness in his life and his words, that he's not using sophisticated arguments that are trying to win, make people impressed with him. He's not leaning on high rhetoric, which footnote on that is very important that we don't misunderstand him to saying that great rhetoric is inherently bad. What he's talking about is the dependence on form rather than substance, right? I mean, because the entire Christian tradition you know, the greatest preacher is the one we, whose names we know and writings we still read going back 2000 years are precisely because they are very gifted sure. uh, rhetoricians, you know, so there's nothing wrong with being a good speaker. It's all about the dependence and the focus. So all that to say, I, I think, you know, we, we model um, the kind of clarity of, of Jesus and we expect that the results are going to be the same thing that happened to him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and obviously almost goes without saying, but to say that we want to speak with authority, but yet it's a, it's a distinct kind of authority than Christ speaking, you know, that, that we wouldn't say the sort of things that he says, you've heard it said, uh, but now I say to you, uh, on the one hand, we do want to speak with that kind of clarity, but yet it's not rooted in our identity, but we're, we're saying, here's what the Lord himself says, and we don't get to make it up. But, yeah, that's, that's really good. I, yeah, it's, you know, to use a couple of metaphors the New Testament uses that are good for preachers. We're ambassadors, which is different than being the king or the president. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, we yeah. Are, and we are witnesses, which is different than being the actual substance, you know. So those are a couple of good metaphors to keep in our minds in terms of what we do. Okay. So now I have kind of a, kind of a cross-pollination question, all right? So with the idea of like, how should Christian preachers be learning from the preaching of Christ? I read this great book recently called Small Preaching, uh, 25 uh, Little Things You Can Do Now to Become a Better Preacher. And in it, the author, you, <laughs> says this on ch in chapter 15. You say that the first minute of your sermon is absolutely crucial for homiletical effectiveness. And then you go on to say, it is your responsibility as a preacher to craft the opening of your sermon with intentionality to grab and keep the attention of the easily distracted people hearing your voice. So with that in mind, Jesus begins his sermon by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And then goes on to give all those Makairos or those, all those blessing statements. Uh, how do you feel, or, or do, you, do you think Jesus had that in mind that he needs to have a, a good opening sentence? Um, but how how does that the opening moments of the Sermon on the Mount play into all that he says afterwards? And how does the first minute of his sermon um, factor into this most famous sermon of all time? Physician, heal thyself. Yeah, uh, that's good, man. That's that's actually a great question. That's really really funny. I've been today. reading a lot of your stuff lately. Yeah, so I, I mean that's I, a that's a very interesting. I noticed patterns. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've never thought about that. Like, what, how did Jesus do in the first minute of his sermon? That's that's it's really funny. But I think the Sermon on the Mount is a great example of both the first minute, and then there's another essay, the last minute. You mm -hmm. know, the, what you do in the last sermon, which I think also he kills it in that, in the sense of how the Sermon on the Mount begins and ends. Yeah, you know, the Beatitudes, uh, I've talked about, you know, a lot of other podcasts as well as just teachings everywhere. And then in the book, of course, the Sermon on Mount book. Um, so I you know, have to resist from saying the whole thing here, but the shortest version of it is the Beatitudes are statements about what true happiness or true flourishing looks like. It was a common um, topic within any ancient philosophy or religion. Uh, as it is for today, for every you know Peloton commercial or you know Lincoln Continental or or uh, you know any worldview that's being sold to you, everybody's promising happiness. And you know some people are doing it crassly for marketing purposes, but most you know many people are doing it out of sincerity. Like mm -hmm. here's a way to live that is going to bring you actual life. You know this is what every philosophy and every religion is about. So in that sense, 
what Jesus does in the first minute of the Sermon on the Mount. I love that question. Uh, he gives nine nine statements about what true happiness or flourishing looks like. That's what the word macroism means. It's what the word beatus means. That's why we call them beatitudes. Uh, the Hebrew word is asher. It's, they all mean the same thing, which is what's the true state of shalom or the true state of flourishing. So in that sense, it's a great opening because he's, on the one hand, tapping into what is a universal human question. In fact, the most universal human question. If you read through philosophy and religion, uh, I'll just quote Augustine as one example of millions, you know, that every thinking person, Augustine says, is concerned about his own happiness. I mean, that is like what drives all of us, whether we realize it or not, whether it's to sacrifice or to, to be gluttonous, everybody thinks that what they're doing is going to bring them happiness or else they wouldn't do it. And so on the one hand, again, Jesus is the great way to open a sermon. He taps right into this universal human question. But the other way the first minute is great is that what he says about happiness is completely unexpected. It is like shocking. So it's this combination of like, oh, this is like, okay, this is a really relevant topic. What's the nature of true happiness? And then what he says is like, what? Happiness or flourishing are those who have a poverty of spirit and are mourning and are hungering and thirsting, which is a negative image, and are merciful, that is, they're forgiving others who have done them wrong, and they're peacemakers, they're bearing the hatchet rather than, you know, insisting on their own justice and rights. I mean, everything. And then finally, he says, those who are persecuted and reviled and misled, that's the state of true happiness. It's crazy. I mean, so this is a very powerful you know, beginning to the first sermon in the first book of the New Testament uh, from Jesus. And wild. Thank you. So why? All right. So if you would say that like this idea of flourishing is um, so central to the opening phrase, and then you could also just say the the life and teaching and the impact of the, the way of Jesus. If, if human flourishing is one of the goals of that sermon, uh, would you also say that it should be a goal of our sermons as well? Uh, should teaching and preaching, expository, whatever, should it include a goal of like, I want to help these people flourish? Yeah, yes. In the sense that um, that is the biggest goal. That doesn't mean that every application point has to be, how do you flourish now? <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, like, okay. You know, in, in any given sermon, you know, this is the beauty of the richness of the Bible, which has a million different things going on and then, and, you know, topics are addressed and theological truths of many, many sorts. So it's not like every sermon needs to become, you know, Haggai three and human flourishing or something, you know, you know but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't even know how many chapters are in Haggai. So I hope I got it right. But anyways, the, I assume there's probably at least three, uh, but the, yes, but at the highest level, yes. I mean, I would say this is what marks my entire ministry and what marks, um, you know, largely the ministry of our church, for example, which I'm not, you know, the only voice there, but it's, I think it's probably fair to say that at our church, that something like that is what we would say our goal is. Um, and I think it's based on, you know, what Jesus himself is saying, not only in the sermon, but in places like John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. You know, when we, I, I think if you want to go to the gospel of John, um, you know, we get these explicit statements multiple times like that, but also even John in narrative voice comes in and says, I've written these things because this testimony is true so that you might have life. Right. Now I know when you and I hear that in this kind of downstream 500 years after the reformation we tend to just think of it in categories of salvation or yeah. like which is true absolutely true but what life would have meant like i am you know, on the roof, you know what what life would have sounded like in the first century is flourishing that is i've come that you might have life meaning like fullness of what it means to be human. And that includes both now and especially life in the new creation, the new coming kingdom. But we tend to think of it like when we think of eternal life, we just kind of translate that in our heads into salvation in heaven or something. Heaven when you die. Or, yeah. Heaven when you die, or maybe if we're a little bit more sophisticated, we recognize new creation kingdom or whatever, but all of that, but we're missing the idea is that that's about living 
I mean, it is actually about living. And this is where the kingdom and new creation theology is really helpful too, to make us remember that's not just like we get there and then we're just standing there, you know, for 10 million times, 10 million years with our arms raised saying, oh, you know, singing it one, you know, a chorus over and over or something. It's actually a life. It, it is a life that's free from sin, a life that's free from suffering, a life that's free from conflict, a life in the presence of God himself, a life of ever increasing joys, but it's life. It's actually living. And that's, so all of our preaching and teaching, our invitation for people to become disciples in my mind is inviting people into increasing depths and layers of life and life abundantly. Um, you know, the paradox of it, of course, is that that primarily looks like suffering and death right now. You know, that that's, that's where we need to not, never misunderstand. Uh, and this is again, what the Beatitudes are talking about that yeah. the true life actually comes through the same life that Jesus lived, which was suffering and taking up his cross and eventually resurrection and mm -hmm. joy in the midst of even that. Um, but it's, this is the paradox of the Christian life. Joy comes through suffering. Uh, life comes through death. Strength comes through weakness. Yeah, there the sure is like a surprising turn in the Beatitudes, you know, where all of a sudden it's blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you, you know, um, that the, the ones that are persecuted for righteousness sake, you'd, you'd think that a person embodying these types of principles or a community would would be the most honored amongst everybody. But instead, Christ says to expect uh, persecution at the end of all mm -hmm. this or as a result of this. Um, so, okay. Now you have taught on the Sermon on the Mount and written on it. Um, I noticed that you, um, during, during lockdown or during quarantine or, or whatever it's called, um, you did kind of an 11 week series on this, mm -hmm. uh, through your church, uh, Sojourn East, um, not from the pulpit, but from no. your desk. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, that's what we were all doing back then, yep, trying to yep. figure, figure those things out. So that was a, an 11 week or 11, 11 videos, I guess. Installments. I don't know, yeah. I don't know right, if they came yeah. out weekly or, or not. I, I don't know either. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember. I think you were wearing the same outfit in all of them. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I sat down and just recorded them. Yeah. They might've yeah. been recorded in one batch. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how, like, if you could, if you could do it again, or let's say even the next time that you were to teach through the Sermon on the Mount, do you think like uh, the pericopes being divided up that way? Um, do you think 10 is enough messages to to get through it uh, is that what i did yeah i couldn't have even told did i do like it yeah it was it was 11 and then, and then the first one was kind okay. of an introduction hmm. and yeah. see the reason why i ask this is because I, i'm preaching on the beatitudes right now a series on the beatitudes and so i have a big stack of you know sure. commentaries and i have uh you know uh, martin lloyd jones right sure. here and and he did and this is um the result of 30 sundays uh preaching through so, uh, you know, he's famous for going slow through passages, right, right, very right. slow, probably. Totally. Um, but if someone was to be planning out the <laughs> yeah. 2023 preaching calendar and maybe great, wants to, to do this, how long would you allocate for this to do it justice? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so one of the joys of having written that book, which has been out five or so years now, is that almost every week I hear from a pastor who's preaching through the Sermon on the Mount and reading the book, which is super encouraging. And, um, you know, and they usually say nice things too, which is nice. <laughs> I don't yeah, think yeah. too many of them write and say, this, this book sucks, you know, or something. <laughs> no, maybe, maybe that is, maybe there are more people that have that opinion. They just haven't taken the time to write, but, but generally I hear from, from kind, kind words from people. And what's been so encouraging to me about it is that to think of all the people that are preaching through the sermon, you know, and, and wrestling with it. And I always tell people, yeah, you can do, um, you can do it super slow or super fast. Um, I think the very minimum, I mean, you could do it in one sermon and there's a sense in which, you know, I don't recommend this, but you know, you could do like a total overview. And I actually just did this Sunday again at a place. A lot of times I go to churches and I'll teach on the weekend, like Friday and or Saturday on the Sermon on the Mount to like, you know, like some kind of theological institute or lay people that are more interested. And then I'll preach Sunday morning generally as like an overview of the sermon. Yeah. And when I do that, I'll do like a quick overview of the big idea. I call it cardiographic reading, you know, this hard emphasis reading. And then I'll land in the conclusion of 713 to 27 and drive it home. 
you know, it's it's fine, but it's only good to do if the Knicks like is happening at the church. I was just at last Sunday. You know, the next eleven weeks, they're going to do a series through it. You know, so the overview is only good if you're doing that. I think the minimum you could do well, and this is the minimum would be five sermons, where you would do the Beatitudes as one, which I've done a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, five seventeen to forty eight is one, uh, which is the the first teaching of greater righteousness being inward, not just outward six, one to 21, which is the um, next big section of, um, you know, practicing piety, not to receive the praise of others, six, 19 to either 19 to 34 or 19 all the way through seven, 12 okay. would be the fourth sermon. And then the last one would be seven thirteen to twenty seven. I think that's the minimum you could do and do it. And it's still that would require a deftness of foot, you know, to be able to do that well. I think probably something more like, um, yeah. I mean, I guess it all depends on what what you want to do with the beatitudes. You know, there are pros and cons of taking each beatitude by itself versus, and you could do that, and lots of people have. That's what I'm doing right now. The Mars one. Yeah, yeah. This is great. I mean, that's the strong tradition of that. Thank you for um, affirming them my choice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I the only the only thing I'd say about all this is that I do think we tend to take too small of chunks of scripture overall when we preach in our traditions. Um, because and then it makes us lose the kind of flow and mm. lose the literary structure. And the Sermon on the Mount is super highly structured. If you look in that book, I have a whole chapter just about the structure of it, um, which is my attempt of after wrestling with it for years, but it was not the only way even, but everybody would agree it's very well crafted. And so all, whenever you're in any part of the sermon, you have to be aware of the whole thing because the whole thing is a structure. It is structured well. And it's really, it's wisdom literature. This is a big part of my argument. And so what you have in the sermon are some principle that's laid out and then usually several examples of it, it always in sets of three. So either three examples of it or six examples of it. And so, so take five, 17 to 48, five, 17 to 20 is the principle laid out. 520 being the key idea, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he gives six examples that are in two sets of three. One, two, three example. And he says, again, I say to you, one, two, three example. And so the reason that's important to understand is that if you're, whenever you're, if you wanted to break that up into six sermons, which is fine, one on anger and murder, one on lust, you know, eventually one on divorce, that totally fine. You could break up 521 to 48, love for enemies into six sermons, but you better make sure that you recognize those are six examples of the same principle, which is you have to have a righteousness greater than the scribes and Pharisees. And the problem with preaching too many sermons or too small of texts, it's really easy to lose sight of that principle. These are six examples. They're not all the examples. This is how wisdom literature works. You lay out a principle and then you get examples. And the point is you're supposed to learn from those examples, how to reason biblically about the same kind of issues, right? Those are, it's, so Jesus is teaching the sermon, are not comprehensive on this topic. They're a principle examples, three or six examples, and then go and learn from how to do this. So that would be an important thing I'd want to say about preaching the sermon. Just know, be aware of that structure. Yeah, that's, that's great because certainly our sermons have structures. <laughs> you know, there's mm-hmm. if we're doing them well, then there's a, you know, the first point hopefully leads into the second point and then the third. And it, the, the point is to have a message. And then if mm-hmm. somebody were to isolate the sections mm-hmm. of our sermons and then have them be independent of yeah. before and after, that's, we'd say, excuse me, hold on, I'm trying to make a single point here. And mm-hmm. I wonder if Jesus... <laughs> you know, had a point and, and, you know, had a, a train of thought that went throughout the mm-hmm. Sermon on the Mount. I believe he did. I think you yes. would argue right. that he certainly yeah. did. Uh, instead of, you know, the book, the Sermon on the Mount is not the book of Proverbs. It's not a collection of little thoughts. Um, mm-hmm. So that being said, I am doing, you know, nine weeks on the Beatitudes and sure. well, yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> uh, but I'll, at the same time, it's, very possible to just have those be a series of proverbs, you know. Um, mm. Blessed are those who mourn. You know, I, I preached that on on yes uh, a couple of days ago, and there's the temptation to just you know address grief 
in general and sadness and loss in the Christian life. And there was a big chunk of my message where I did that. But I'm also trying to connect this with the previous thing. Blessed mm-hmm. are those who are poor in spirit and then show this kind of progression that it plays into it. So having kind of like a, a topical mm-hmm. Uh, a section of it, but then realizing this is part of a train of thought from our Lord. I guess you have any advice for me or other people who have decided rather than let it be a unified unit, uh, but have it be a series of standalone messages. I think it's just the same thing I just said, just recognize that it is a series and that these are not meant to be, um, yeah, just kind of one-off statements, but th- there's a cumulative effect to them for yeah. sure by having nine of them in a row. Um, it does have a, it does come to a head in the eighth and ninth Beatitudes. And that's part of the debate is how many Beatitudes are there, but uh, I think there are nine very clearly, but the eight, the ninth is a reiteration and a kind of deepening of the eighth Beatitude. So recognizing there's kind of a uh, progression to them. Historically, uh, the Beatitudes, uh, which were obviously hugely influential, were read as a ladder um, up toward God. So there's a lot of the tradition of preaching on the Beatitudes. It sees them as a sequence actually of, of spiritual formation. Um, I'm not necessarily saying you have to preach in that way, but just to acknowledge that's how most Christians have understood that the Beatitudes are again in a, they're in an order for a reason. So however you determine whether how strongly you want to emphasize that either way, you shouldn't just preach one beatitude who's kind of a one-off thing and come back next week for another principal nugget, you know, sure. or something. And to remember that at this overview level, what I said earlier when we were talking is that these are shocking statements about what happiness is. Like I would want to keep coming back to that each time, because I think that's the, that's the cumulative effect of them together is this is the vision. He's laying out the second like kind of vision for, for what true life is, it is shocking. You know, I want to not miss that aspect of it. Yeah. 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 We're titling the series, the, the contrarian values of King Jesus, that each one just goes against um, what you would expect. Um, Let let me, let me just say my only regret. Okay. I have have two regrets about the Sermon on the Mount, he before you book, which otherwise I'm, you know, happy with the one is I had intended to spend a lot more time in pre-modern exegesis, especially patristic exegesis. And I just ran out of time and, uh, and the book was already long. And so the intention from the beginning was to root, root its reading more deeply. That is in the commentary section the, the, the book has two parts. The first part is kind of yeah. a laying out of how to read this term and what are the issues, what were some of the key mm-hmm. ideas. And the second part is the commentary proper. And that's my one regret that I didn't. And if I get a chance to do a second edition, which hopefully I will, I'll do, I'll beef it up in that way. And let me recommend to you, Rebecca Eklund. Uh, she teaches at Loyola in Baltimore. <laughs> I think that's right. But Eklund, E-K-L-U-N-D. She's got uh, just a stellar book on the history, the interpretation of the Beatitudes. It's very readable. I use it as a textbook whenever I teach a sermon now. I endorse the book. You'll see my endorsement on there. And she just goes chapter by chapter through each Beatitude and and walks through how people have read it historically from the church fathers all the way up to the modern period. It's stunning. And it's very readable. So not too late to get that. It's um, not. Too, I'm going to order it as soon as. Yeah, in fact, I'm so going to hurry up and wrap this up so I can order it. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what I want. Yeah, it's and I'm only really two good. weeks in, so there's yeah. I, good. <laughs> that's you can that's go back wonderful. and fix the other ones. <laughs> uh, so, but that relates to my second regret about the book is that it's so embarrassing. Is that when you get to the commentary section, as you may have gathered, I never actually address each of the attitudes individually. Yeah, I know it's kind of frustrating. It's, a huge, a huge, <laughs> it's, it's uh, the the idea of the beatitudes exactly. is addressed, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, but like, help me out here. <laughs> totally. Total L. It's a total L or a fail. Total an L, as my kids would say, is total loss. There that, and the reason was it's just embarrassing. The reason was is that the book kept evolving as I wrote it. And the original plan was to do something more like a, an exposition, kind of a very accessible exposition of the sermon, not a sermon on it, but like a kind of scholarly exposition at this kind of broader level. Mm-hmm. So I kind of did all this other work and then did that for the Beatitudes. And then as I got into 517 and follow, or five, you know, I guess the 13 and following, 
I kind of kicked into just the issues are so much and so much going on. I kind of kicked into a more commentary proper kind of mode. And then I got to the end and I realized I hadn't really done that with the Beatitudes, but again, it was kind of like, well, uh, well, you know, time's up kind of thing. And the book was already long. And so again, if I get to do a second edition, that'll be the obvious expansion is to go back and kind of and expand on that. I mean, I, honestly, I, I do think what, the contribution is that the vision I do give for reading the Beatitudes, I think yes. is significant and yep. substantive overall. And so that's why I think that it's still good to read that section of the commentary and the earlier chapter, because I'm casting this kind of overall vision of how they all work. But again, I just regret that I didn't kind of go in depth into each of the individual ones. So well, second okay. edition. As, some, as someone, I'm your target audience, as someone who bought this, hoping that it would be. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, ah. I, I I remember where I was and I kind of like turned the page and then it was like the last chap the last page of that section and then it started the next bit. I was like, wait, where's where's he gonna I'm go so through sorry. this? And then I was like, well, it's not there, but I don't regret it one bit. Cause I think that first the first half of this, all this stuff on like, you know, the idea of what a what a blessing is and all that was like so valuable. I was like, Well, it wasn't what I wanted, but it turns out right. it was what I needed. Turns out I need the second edition. <laughs> so you yes, hurry up I'm, and write <laughs> I'm really sorry. And as one who preaches a lot too, and now now my reading of commentaries is primarily homiletical more than academic, you know, yeah. like when I'm, I'm in a busy week as well. And I'm like, we're preaching through second Corinthians right now. And I want to go to a commentary and get some help on these ideas, you know, particularly so I can take my notes and then write my own sermon, you know? And it's, so my deepest apologies That's to fine. you and all I'll those. Go get, still buy the book, still read the book, book you know, because <laughs> I do think it's beneficial what I say in there, but uh, yeah, in the band suits, I, I should have done more. So, but Eckland is, me is your, Eckland is, your is the one to go to yeah, and I'll order that sure. book right away. Yep. Well, so just on a final thought, like, you know, this conversation has been great. I, I loved well, a few minutes ago when you just like quoted Matthew 11 from, from memory. And I've, I've heard you speak elsewhere about like, part of even like wisdom literature, which you would say that the Sermon on the Mount falls under that. So that part of understanding scripture and this kind of literature specifically is memorization. So hmm. do you have any, any thoughts or closing thoughts on, on the, the value of like memorizing this as a means of deepening our understanding? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm happy to confess that um, I understand this better than I practice, you know? And so uh, I have had the Sermon on the Mount memorized. I could not do it right now. Um, it's not fresh for me. Bits and pieces of it are, you know, but but it is super valuable. And I'll just say a couple of things about it. It's very interesting. I teach a PhD seminar on the history of the interpretation of the Gospels every couple of years. And one of the things that comes out really clearly, especially in the medieval period, is that and this was true for earlier times too but it's really explicit in the medieval period that memorization was the primary means of bible study because they recognized that memorization is the only way you can really meditate which is the goal of reading scripture is mm -hmm. to actually meditate on it spiritually and personally and memorization is what enables that now that was practiced all the way back into the ancient world and this is why um patristic exegesis and all pre-modern exegesis is so different than ours is because whenever they're talking about one text of the scripture, their brains are firing and all the other ones that have the same words and same ideas. And so this is what you see. And you see it in the Puritans too, but in pre-modern interpretation, that's like, they're all over the place in the Bible. It's not because they're loosey goosey. It's mm -hmm. because it's all memorized and they cannot help, but make all these connections between things and that at memorization in other words has a lot to do to explain the hermeneutics of all of pre-modern interpretation um, and that's a bigger interesting topic but in the medieval period they were really explicit about it that they would even they develop these kind of techniques that like current people if you go to las vegas or whatever and see some guy who can you know you flip nine thousand cards in front of him as he tells you all of them or whatever those techniques they use they developed in the medieval period like a mind map you're walking into a cathedral and on the left is this and I, you know that's the exact same technique so all that's really good and that comes back to the bigger point then and again which is that the reason why memorization is so important is because that is really the goal of holy scripture that we might be transformed as it seeps into us and we meditate on it and even though I couldn't verbatim produce the Sermon on the Mount right now, I could say that it 
it haunts me happily constantly mm-hmm. because I've spent so much time in it and phrases from it and expressions and ideas from it are always present to me because it's because I've given the labor to understand it. And, and so, yeah, I think the, the one of the most important things to do when we think about all of the Bible, but we're talking here about the sermon is to, to spend the time committing at least chunks of it to memory. Um, I, read a lot of poetry as well. And I recently, had, or some time ago, I memorized that I recently kind of re, reworked on it. Uh, one of my favorite poems, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night um, by, uh, Crank, I just lost his name. Um, and, you know, it was so, so striking to see this, that when you memorize a poem, because of the active kind of learning that it is, rather than the passive kind of learning that reading tends to be, memorization is a very active form you actually start to understand it in a different way. So like if you memorize the stanzas of do not be gentle to that good night, um, it, it's like in the memorization of it because you have to figure out hooks to memorize it. I, I finally understood like what the flow of the poem was. Like I had read it and heard it many times, but it was not until I memorized it. I said, oh, that's why, oh, 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 oh. And it, it did not matter how many times I read it. It was still a passive experience, but it's the memorization that really deepens the understanding. So that's my invitation to you. It's a reminder to myself of how good this is as well. Well, thank you. Yeah, very much. Could could we hear? Do not go gently into that night. Oh, no. Great. Come on. You're really trying to bust me? Oh, <laughs> I did just, I mean, it's been a couple months since I've recited it. Um, oh, my goodness. You're totally fair. Totally fair. I, either that uh, or the Sermon on the Mount. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I, I really can recite all of Do Not Go Gentle into that good night, but I don't think I can. It's been a couple months since I've. Since okay, I've okay, okay, okay. Oh no, bummer! Way to end on that note. Totally <laughs> All fair. right, well, totally fair. It ends with a fizzle. <laughs> yeah, totally. Wah, wah, wah. Still buy the book. Buy the book. Yeah, go buy the book. That's all that matters. So. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you very much, and uh, definitely looking forward. You said you're contributing a chapter to the um, the 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 book about Jesus as a teacher. What what's that titled, and who's putting it out, and when can we expect that? All good questions. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. The, the, no, those are the title is, I don't know, but it's okay. in the LNTS volume. It's probably Jesus' teacher in Matthew or something like that. Uh, the editors are Charles Quarles, Chuck Quarles, and Nathan Riddle Hover, um, who are both at Southeastern people. And there's a whole bunch of chapters in it. I'm writing the essay on. Uh, Jesus as teacher in Matthew in his Greco-Roman philosophical context, which okay. is, you know, part of my shtick. And so, but other people have written on like Jesus teacher in his second temple Jewish context, Jesus is, you know, the style of his teaching, all that. So yeah, it shouldn't be a very good volume. Yep. Yeah. I, I look forward to it. Anything else you want to hype before we go? <laughs> um, well, now I just feel bad about the whole. That's fine. That's fine. Like, <laughs> when's when's <laughs> the next um, uh, theologians in cars get I have not recorded that. You know, COVID killed that. And then I just have been so busy with other things. Um, people often ask me because I, I loved it. It was so great. Uh, my The car was out of commission for a while. My son is now driving it. Actually, I got it fixed and and I bought myself a brand new car. And now, okay. I'm, now that I have a new car, I'm like, it's pretty nice to drive a brand new car instead of an old, old car. So my son's enjoying it, not the gas prices, but uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'll get back to that or not. I, I have another, uh, some friends I've worked with in various capacities that are pretty well-known people have asked me to do a podcast with them. And I, I have decided not to at this point, just because um, yeah, just my schedule and the things that I want to concentrate on. So yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Not a good, more, more fizzle for the end. So. <laughs> okay. Trying to write, trying to write and trying to be a good pastor. That's good what job. I'm really trying to do. I'm trying to spend a lot of time with people and ministering to people and, and, uh, and concentrate on my own spiritual, spiritual mental health as well. So yeah, I would love, I love doing those things, but uh, yeah, not in the foreseeable yeah. future. Yeah. And that's ultimately a more important investment than, you know, stuff for me to consume in a different <laughs> continent, just for me to to have on in the background while I do something else. You know, there's real people who, who need you and I'm glad that they have you. 
And anyway, thanks yeah. for all the stuff you've written. I appreciate it. As you've heard, I've read read quite a bit. I know there's there's more. Uh, Jesus, the Great Philosopher is actually, I ordered it a while ago and it, it has been delayed getting here, but. Oh, really? Or, oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's Ireland, so we don't have the same access to Amazon Prime and whatever that the rest of you do. Well, I hope uh, that I really, that book was a lot of, a lot of heart and a lot of fun for me. So I look forward to hearing what you have to think about it. So. Okay. I'll be honest. It's actually kind of, I want to skim through it and then I'm giving it as a gift to somebody else who actually is uh-huh. like a, he's a philosophy lecturer <laughs> at the university. And I think he'll, he'll get it more than I do, but uh, I'm going to, Oh, it's very it. accessible. I mean, it's not, it's not an academic book. It's oh, well. starts with Nick Offerman and, and uh, you know, it's got all kinds of crazy stuff in it. So, but anyways, okay. On that bang, we're gonna end this yes. conversation. <laughs> How many fizzles can we have to end the conversation? <laughs> no, that one's a, yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, cool. I hope that this episode and all the way you at the Expositors Collective helps you to grow in your personal study and public proclamation of God's word. Thanks, Jonathan. Wow. Well, thank you so very much, Jonathan. Really appreciate talking to you. Hope to speak to you again in 2023. Uh, Make sure that you look at the show notes because there's links to every book that has been referenced as well as ways to engage and follow and find out more from Dr. Pennington. Well, you certainly know this, but the Expositors Collective is certainly more than just a podcast. We really highlight and focus our effort and ministry on in-person training events that have taken place uh, across the US and occasionally in Europe. And our next in-person training weekend for men and women of all ages is gonna be in Boise, Idaho on October 14th and 15th. Gonna be hosted by our friends at Calvary Boise. So you can find out information about that at expositorscollective.com. There's the early bird registration that we really want you to take advantage of. And you can find out more details, as I mentioned, at expositorscollective.com. Make sure to connect to us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and join our Facebook private community. Uh, We're at about 400 members now, and it's a great way to ask questions about sermons, to discuss the most recent episode, or just in generally to geek out about preaching. So facebook.com slash groups slash expositors collective. Hope to see you there. All right. I hope that this episode and all that we do at the Expositors Collective helps you to grow in your personal study and public proclamation of God's word. God bless you.